Ja, äh, äh, guten Morgen, äh, Kate Fernand ist heute da und wird uns ein bisschen was über ihre Arbeit erzählen. Und ich will es auch gar nicht lang machen, du kannst dich ja am besten selber kurz vorstellen. Und äh, ähm, in case anybody needs some sort of English translation... Aber wir, wir machen das nicht. Ja. Hm? Also wir machen das auf Englisch. Okay. Du bist auf Englisch. Ja, ich bin es durch. Dann ist es falsch. Nein, nein, nein. 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 Okay. So, ich bin Kathi van Eck. Ich war geboren in den Niederlanden. Und seit vielen Jahren lebe ich jetzt in Zürich. Ich arbeite dort. I teach in Bern at the Academy of the Arts. I kept a strong link to The Hague, where I am a, a teaching at Sonology, and where I am also a member of III. We are an um, artist-run collective, and uh, well, you find a lot of information on us when you look at instrumentinventors.org. We're instrument inventors, but in the broader sense of the world. Word, so you won't find really new instruments, but more near into new setups, trying out things in between science, sound, and all kinds of other technologies and senses. Um, today, I'm going to talk about my work where I combine movements and sounds. And uh, I will mainly do this with the help of two of my works in Paradiso and Empty Chairs. And I will start with a short example on what I like about working with movements and sounds. Um, so one of the things which changed when we have electronics is that we can do things which, with sensors. So I can use sensors and... Um, <laughs> Are you using sensors to It's good that the, you say something because I forgot to tell you if there's any question in between when I speak, uh, just either talk in or do something like this, <laughs> and then, uh, or, or if, if you have any command or something not clear, please let me know. Um, so, since we have sensors and um, we can make connection between our movements and sounds in different ways than we could before because we're not bound to the physical limits of objects. And there are many attempts actually in this, the design of new instruments to design instruments that can be played as if they were acoustic instruments. And that's a branch I find really interesting, but it's not the direction I would like to go into today and not the direction my works take. I'm really interested in something where I can combine movements and sounds in ways what can't be done by acoustic instruments. So often you read about making <coughs> a setup as, as expressive as acoustic instruments are, and that's the direction I would say. Very interesting, but not my direction. I'm interested in doing things you can't do with acoustic instruments, and which might be not at all in expressive, but might be something else. So, um, to show you an example of this is what we can do with, um, here there are sensors inside, and you all know this when you turn the phone, the screen turns, and uh, there are all kinds of sensors in it, and uh, that's why it's a, quite a safe sensor device to work with. And what I can do with these sensors is, for example, I can move it, and then the sound is triggered. And depending, every time I move it up, I can have a different sound. And the sound can also continue. If you think about this sound, and you would have that done by a violin, then you can imagine. We'll stop after that. <laughs> you would have to do a lot of movement, but I just have to do like this, right? And I could even just press the space bar, and I would also hear this sound. I, I'm not so much interested in pressing the space bar, but thinking like, okay, how could I kind of make that movement more difficult? <coughs> so I'm putting extra effort, which I don't need to do technically, but putting extra effort to make the piece played by me as a body 
and at the same time having the, so to say, the nonsense relationship of something happening and continuing for which I would have to touch the violin all the time or I would have to blow the clarinet all the time and here I just have, I could have five minutes playing. I don't think that would uh, be very handy on stage, but I could have just do, do it once and then wait for five minutes and that would be my piece. In this case, uh, this is a piece where, which starts with, I say, releasing some bird-like sounds and when I started I tried to create an environment for it. It's actually a fragment, mini fragment of my newest piece called April Sky and it's an April sky, so it's changing in different ways. And there are also many sounds in the sky. Which, well, none of them, like all the sounds you heard now, and it's already a bit in the piece, um, are not real bird sounds, but kind of artificial bird-like sounds, which might sound like birds for some people, might sound less like bird for other people. I come on stage with a a bag, the kind of uh, these very common. I think you all got one. I see one there of the festival. You know this this kind of bag, the grey one. And I have a jacket on, and on the, in the jacket underneath the jacket there are two phones, because um, I work a lot with sensors, sensor interfaces such as Arduino or Raspberry Pi, Bela. Recently, is one of my favorites, although it's very expensive. Um, but the good thing about phones is that they are super sure for on stage things. For installations it's fine to work with different things. Also on stage it's okay, but something like Jenky rings, which is very nice interface, but as soon as you do sort of things like me where I walk away from the computer, it loses connection, etc. So phones are super safe. And uh, that's where I work a lot with them. And my students always think that's really not sexy. They're always like, ah, oh, you work They never want to do that. And I'm always like, it's at least for prototyping, it's such a good device. You have it always with you. I mean, I'm, I'm definitely not performing with this phone normally. I, prefer, I have my own performance phones. Um, <laughs> which are, by the way, also the cheapest. Because old, old phones are very cheap nowadays. Because people keep on throwing them away and thinking they need a new phone. So that's what happens in this piece. I come on stage, I have a jacket on, I have a bag with me, so it's kind of outside feeling. And then I start to look around and I embed the gestures I have to make, which is releasing the birds inside an environment. So it starts with some background noise, I would say. Uh, it is actually a field recording which has been uh, processed a bit. And the birds I release continue to fly, so you hear them a bit further away later on. During the performance, the two loudspeakers are in this back, so where I release the birds. So the birds come from here, and then when they are released, they come through the loudspeakers in the hall. That's, of course, something you won't hear yet now, but I will play you a bit of the beginning so you get a bit of an impression. Um, 
So that's one of the things I like is to have a gesture and, and to, uh, or a movement I would say, to have a movement which I put into an environment where it makes different sense and it could be just a space bar, but by uh, composing the movement and composing the environment for the movement it becomes something which has a different kind of, of uh, relationship to the sounds than when I would press the space bar. There, the other thing I like <coughs> of um, electronic sounds is that we can really take many parameters when we use sensors and we can scale them in such a way that they don't relate anymore to what we are used to when playing a instrument. So it's the other way around, where we just had the just do a click and you can have a long sound. In this case, this yet every movement you make is used to process the sound, but it's used to process the sound in a way which is absolutely not non-linear. Absolutely sounds a bit more radical than it is. But um, it's non-linear in the sense that when I make a bow movement on the violin, there are certain things which can happen. If I don't bow with a lot of pressure, it will be a little bit noisy, and then there will be less noisy with more pressure, etc. I'm not a violin player at all, so I should not say too much about it. <laughs> but um, there, we all know that there are certain things in, but there are certain things which can't happen that easy. For example, you can't suddenly, when you just make a movement like this, having three notes repeating like -ru -ru -ru, that's no option that's just like then you have to change your movements but with electronics we can do that and I like that that there is some possibility of doing a kind of over um, using <coughs> the, the body movements like every small thing you change changes something that's what I do in later on in this <coughs> piece I have to put I've taken the loudspeaker out of my back and I can keep them in the hand in my hand so, um, in this case, I just use the phone again. When they're here, there are a little bit different movements I can make because oh, perhaps I try a bit like this. Let's see. I didn't rehearse that, but... <laughs> <laughs> so, when they're here, then um, I have to make bigger movements. So, I, when I'm still... So these are, right, when I'm bowing the violin, the changes are, I wouldn't say bigger, but they are of a different quality than when, when you bow the violin. There are different things you can change with this kind of system. I know the system, of course, quite well because I programmed it, so I know that if I move slowly, there won't be this modulation happening. If I move quickly, there will be more modulation. If I move a little bit up, there's a certain part, you hear this also where a second tone is involved here, there's just one note, two, etc. So I can play with that, so I have the, I have the loudspeaker in my hand, the, the sound is evidently coming from that loudspeaker, but here again I organize the reply from the whole, so to say, from my environment. So we, we will play that now. This is the... loudspeaker from here, the, the loudspeaker, mm -hmm. the other one from the hall, so you hear a bit more differentiation. Um, so that's just some practical <coughs> things I wanted to show you before going to pieces where I have more so what documentation of. Um, but <coughs> what you just heard is April Sky. No videos yet, nothing yet. Um, and what I would, would like to continue with is what I like to do is making a kind of um, theoretical framework for what I do. And um, in this case today, these are, this is a theoretical framework 
your origins of sounds, which I developed. There's also an article on it. I'll give you later on the title of the article, um, which is quite close to the title of this lecture. In the article, I talk mainly about other people's work, but today I will mainly talk about my work <coughs> and look how I can, how do I work with these terms. One of the things I'm interested in is taking, developing these terms with the help of other people's work, looking what are other people doing, and then also using them for myself as a kind of help for my compositions. How am I dealing with this? Um, how do these relate, these uh, approaches, these categories relate to my own work? Um, evidently, the compositions are not completely explained by these categories, so you might see some moments where the, the, uh, the compositions are not examples of doing this, but they have a, it's the relationship between theory and practice, which has a mutual relationship, but not an exclusive relationship to each other. Um, I start with a quote by Paul Kahn. During sound production, the visibility of synchronous physical action can augment auditory perception or push it in a certain direction. This is from his book, Composing Under the Skin, the music made the body of the composer's desk. It's mainly on instrumental music and the body. It's a very nice and interesting book where he discusses a lot of different uh, um, composers, and it's mainly about non-electronic sound. Nonetheless, for me, it's very interesting because it deals so much with the body, and I, one thing I have to say before I start to, to talk more about changing this auditory perception is that I'm actually very fond of, of instrumental music and also of acousmatic music where you don't see anything, um, where it's about just listening. Two things I can, I have, and that one is the taking a bite, and the other one, chewing. So that. These are the two, so I have, it's like a two knob piece. I could play it with space bar and uh, number one on the computer. Um, more or less, because sometimes the two, how it also depends a bit. Some of the things are also um, controlled by how, how, how do you say this? How much I chew, so if I chew very, <laughs> or just lighter, it might be. Force of chewing, that's it. So here you see it, this is a bite, and then every bite triggers a new phrase, and then the choose triggers different thing during that phrase. And I take a bite again, and then the choose trigger again something. Depending on where, how many choose I've done, it can, so I know at a certain point that if I chew long enough, the sound's going to change, so I have to take a certain amount of choose. I could also play the piece very fast, but physically, and that's what, why, what I'm looking for also, is it's giving me physically some constraint, because one of the things I still have to chew, I just can't take a lot of bites at once, at a certain moment it's just finished with how many bites you a mouth can fit, so then I have to chew first. So it, um, that's one of the constraints I have in comparison with doing this on the computer where I just need two knobs. Um, yeah, so and the, the, the amount of choose between two bytes is flexible, that's also important because that really depends on how big was your bite and, and sometimes I, I feel like, oh I didn't take a big enough bite for what I musically want and sometimes I'm like, oh this was, I still have to chew but actually I would like to continue musically, so that's one of the constraints I have during the piece. I show you the very beginning. Oh yeah, one thing I didn't explain in the <coughs> schematic. This is the only other thing there is, but this is very easy. This is a amplifying microphone, so there I just say to the sound engineer doing the piece, please amplify the apple tuning as nicely as possible. And that's only what it's doing. So that's what you hear in the beginning. You hear the apple sound amplified, and then at a certain moment, the third byte, you hear the first time that it goes into what I call, it's also an amplified apple, but it's um, it's amplifying the apple in a different way than just amplifying the sound, but more amplifying the sonic. Let me see. A, a different sonic world of how a eating an apple could also sound.
parts, and as you hear when I bite, when the first time there's an extra sound, there's a layer in the background, and that changes when I take the second, the second time I bite after that, and also uh, then I know that ah, there there are gonna be new bites, and at a certain moment when I continue, I know ah, if I bite long enough, this is gonna happen. As, uh, if I chew long enough, this is gonna happen. Sorry, a uh, technical question. How does the sensor differentiate, or how did you program it so that the difference is when you take a bite than when you're chewing a regular? Uh, yeah, so what I use as a sensor are, are simply, well, contact, mi yeah, contact microphones. And um, what they differentiate, it's on an apple. So the apple looks, that's the bite. And the chew is happening here. Okay, so, so it's, it's the apple, the one that changes that, the... Yeah, okay. the app, so I know when I take a bite that the only thing I have to take care of is that I don't, because during the piece I sometimes change to give it a kind of a natural, I don't like the word natural, but <laughs> a natural image of someone eating an apple, which as you see I'm playing a bit with because evidently no one is eating an apple like that, but it should look a bit natural. If I to put it in the other hand I have to take care not to do it with too much force because then I would trigger a bite. Mm. And then when I rehearse the piece I sometimes also just hit the apple to <laughs> <laughs> not have to eat. <laughs> uh, so uh, there is a super interesting uh, coincidence for me because at the EM in Graz every Monday we analyze a piece and last Monday we analyzed this piece together. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> and we were uh, kind of arguing uh, with in students and with Marco uh, and what's the so I can have the direct font <laughs> now. Uh, what's the degree of what's your degree of freedom in this piece? And also another point of argument was what was the the degree of engagement between you and the audience in this piece? Mm -hmm. So, so I, I, yeah. I, next um, Monday I would say, I meant. <laughs> <laughs> I have, the, yeah, I have so the real thing. <laughs> the degree of freedom, I always think it's super limited till I see other people perform the work and then I'm like, oh wait, <laughs> there are certain things I... So, it, um, so like, because we have this arrow where uh, there's not one to ten, because it's forcing, but to analyze the piece, we, we use this handy thing with Harrow, with maximum and minimum. Where would you put your degree of freedom? Yeah, well, I would say it's not in a linear scale. I would say freedom, is because the freedom here is, where's the degree? Well, the degree of freedom is, is evidently in when I chew. Mm -hmm. that's so the, and that's also very important for me. That's one of the things that I'm really concentrating on when performing the, the piece is, it, it, I'm just playing the attacks more or less, and a bit like how how forceful do I chew, but that's very difficult to control because it just also depends on the amount of apple I have in my mouth. So I, I can't really say like, oh yeah, I need more apple, and then yeah, but there, no, the, so this is, um, which I also like to have some constraints on stage. But then the, how quick I chew, and you will see that, well, you, you have seen it then probably, so th there, that that's where I'm like, when there's the late one, when I show when I'm chewing more regularly or chewing, and there's also a part where I chew sometimes quicker. So that that's completely up to me, or actually notated down also in the school, like I write in the school. And yeah. also, that there is a point we were also in that video, but it, did you make a mistake at the end when you uh, when you just took the apple, or it was on purpose? <laughs> that was the when, when I there is a point where you 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 kind of put the, the apple away and start a trigger at very at the end of, of that that video that that video that we just had. I, I, just, that I don't just remember that well. It can be that there's a mistake in the video. No, it's, it we, we were wondering if it was on purpose that like you throw the the, the on the floor. Uh, yeah and, and there is a, no, not at the, the very floor. end. At the very end, yes. Okay, and and, but know. but not, not that's that's not important. That's, I was just remembering that, and also we were. But important is uh, how how much is your engagement with the um, oh, with the audience? Yeah, that that's with. Well, I'm definitely I'm performing this for the audience. So, <laughs> but at the same time, like you watch them in the eye. Yeah, I watch this, them in the eye. How much you feel? Yeah, I I'm very much. So if I would perform that here. By the way, also a bit with the April Sky, which I did in the beginning, but it's very difficult to get that feeling during a, to do that right and during a lecture, like I do, did now, um, and without having the... 
but I, I look the audience in the eyes and I look around and, and uh, in this case it was a, quite a theater hall so I didn't see anything but I remember very well the first time I performed it and it was, there was no, it was in a kind of gallery context and I had an audience where I also knew a lot of friends and, and that was quite a, because the, I keep the audience interaction is not I'm not laughing back or something like that or I'm just looking at them and I'm eating the apple so quite there is seriously. a strong theatrical research in your also in your performances I mean non, yes uh, it's theatrical definitely. aspect yeah it's a strong theatrical um, aspect how do you feel you never now? theater without the sound so the sound the theater is just there to amplify the sound and not okay that's so it should be always underneath, that's why sound is always first and the theatre is just to, as Paul says, to augment it a bit, it's a bit of visuality. But not, that's also what I often have to tell if someone else performs the work, like, don't make a theatre. Okay. It's, not, it's not you being funny, it's yeah. you just really being busy with the apple and chewing at the right moment. Yes, yes that's very important because also sometimes I, I see this emphasizes the theatrical gesture on pieces like this and I find it uh, very can I say kitschy when 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 they emphasize too much the theatrical aspect and in this case it's not emphasized because as you said it's below so you're not a trained actor uh, so it's, I, I don't know maybe you are but <laughs> but that's important because we have to remind that we are musicians and we are not actors it's a different thing Okay, no, just I, I was yeah. so curious because I, I just I also wanted to take this. Um, I actually had a question also concerning the theatrical performance, and so I don't know how to properly describe it, but um, when how how why did you make the choice to actually perform this instead of just naturally eating an apple and then using that sound instead? Because you're consciously controlling obviously the way you chew and what you do, instead of it actually just happening and then using that. Why did you make the choice to actually? basically to um, guide it yourself in the moment instead of just having it naturally happen. You could have just eaten the apple and just chewed the way you would chew. But you actually did consciously control the time that you did it to control the sound. You know what I mean? Yeah, because I think one of the, the things I'm related is very interesting is how our body feeds back on what we hear. Mm -hmm. So, and that's what this piece is also about. It's like, I'm chewing the way I am because of what I hear and not not, it's, so it's not a, in that way, a performance piece where it's a process which I let go. Then I would also never make a max patch like that, which really reacts on then this happened and then this happened and then this happened. Um, but but a, a performance piece which is on eat the apple and eat it the way it sounds. So the sound is, so to say, giving me mm -hmm. the impetus to how I have to act. And yeah. I have one other small question. You said you don't like apples. Why did you choose an apple then? <laughs> <laughs> it's a very sounds, simple question. Sounds question. better than a banana. <laughs> 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 no, but no, but I'm only choosing a pear, for example. In Why do you like an apple? I always <laughs> like to use, um, what I say, uh, in my setups I like to use objects that are, that are heavy with connotations. So they, and an apple is of course a very heavy connotation object in, in, in Art, there are so many relationships to apple without making it ever saying anything about. I mean, as in the title in this case, <laughs> Paradisum, that's already a clear <laughs> pointer, but there are many more pointers to apples. So the, the, the apples are, um, and also apple is for me like a kind of, it's such a common fruit, and so many people have experiences eating apples. So that's, I thought that's. Mm -hmm. yeah. I quickly go on with. Other common object, empty chairs. So this is a piece where I put chairs in different arrangements and where I'm also interested in, again, having movements and giving them some constraints. So in this case, I could play it also with the controller with three knobs and leaving, pushing one knob and the other and the other and carrying them from uh, one part to the other is not needed at all if I would just push the knobs, but in this case to push, keep the knob down, I have to carry the chair, and when I put down the chair, the knob is off, up again. Um, so here, again, the, the setup where I, as soon as we see chair, well, like here, so the beginning of the piece actually, I, I start to set up the chairs, it are only three chairs, but I start to set them up in what I always say, conference, like, or 
lecture or something like that. So as if people, I, if, if I'm placing them for a lecture and then during the piece it, it's changed into here they are in a more chaotic, I, this more the social where they have different, get different relationships to each other, the chairs, without again making anything explicit. I don't like anything to be clearly formulated. I always say like, I do that because I don't want to say it with words. And also because I strongly believe that combining certain movements and sounds communicate something else than what words would be able to do. Um, so I show you this because it's um, uh, it's again making movements which we do not have to make. Although in the piece itself, of course, I have to make them. It's actually it's quite a. This is one of I know that, and you will see that also. I have to put the three chairs on a row and have them there. The, the, on a row is not ne not completely necessary, but I have to have them at a certain point, so I have to move them a certain amount of times to make sure that the next part is done. So it's, it's a kind of game-like situation which the audience doesn't know, but I know it on stage and I also know that, okay, if I don't do this, the piece is not going to continue. So as soon as the chairs are standing, not moving, it continues forever with that sound. And as soon as I move them, it goes forwards in a, it doesn't matter what it really is, it's a, it's a kind of sampler, but a bit, uh, yeah. Uh, Time based, but a sample which is a bit different than normal. So starting and this chair will start to click as soon as I touch it now next time but that's because that's the way I program so it's a kind of there are rules in the patch that as soon as I touch it it starts to click that's what I mean. Again, also what you just asked about the apple, it's not a performance in the sense of a process. I, I don't do a process and I, the result is open. The result is very fixed in the sense that I, it's more like a game. I have to do a certain amount of stuff to be sure that things continue and otherwise I would just stay in the piece forever. Um, Sorry, one question. Um, uh, do you, when you make the rules as you were talking before, are those rules like really fixed or do you play with variables of like, I don't know, weighted randomness or... So like every performance will be fairly similar to each other or is it something where it can really... 
go to a web degree where it's completely different? That's a difficult question. I work a lot with weighted randomness, but I'm not sure um, what you mean with like this performance, for example, here, I always end this with taking the microphone and going to the next part. But when I take the microphone exactly, it's quite unsure. And how long I then continue with moving the chairs. So but is this, uh, the sound completely the same? No, 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 that depends a bit. No, 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 it's always slightly different, depending on what I do when, how long I do that, the, the, the tempo changes, what kind of sounds I've chosen, etc., where I stop it. So it's always, for me, it's always, uh, that's why, for me, it's, for me, this is actually the, how would I say that? The piece, when I play it, I feel most, in, most in, inside, because I, I have, there is a, a lot of variety, in a way, more than in the Apple piece. Because depending on when I've stopped the chair, the sound will be different, so it's always a bit different. But you will recognize things. You will, you will, if you see the same piece, I think you will fairly well. It's a different, how do you say, it's a different, um, it, it's a different interpretation format than with a string quartet. But it's a, I think it's more, when, if you look at electronic music, how, when it's played live, it's more related to that where you might change which sample you use, where you might change how your parameters are for the physical modeling a bit, and due to that, it changed a bit. I, was, I think that's it. And what uh, role does humor play for you? Because it's also very funny what you do, which is quite rare and contains the music still. With the humor? Yes. Yeah. Um, well, for myself, I know that the, um, I don't think it's it's funny, <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think that's important. <laughs> I never can can think of oh this, I make a funny piece. But the first time I realized that perhaps what I do has something to do with humor was what, I have a piece for a plant, and I remember coming on stage for that piece, and the audience was laughing. This is years ago. Right? It was 2007 or something like that, um, and I I remember that I was really shocked people were laughing and I felt so, they're laughing at me. <laughs> and now I found out, well, with the Apple piece, people are also, I know now, but for me, I, I just have to think very serious about how are these chairs sounding and I can't think about it about the humor. Yeah, but it's probably also that it's a bit absurd in the context of contemporary music sometimes, or, or does it, doesn't, you know, isn't it important for you at all? Because it, it, it's in the, you know, Concept. usually you would expect some musicians on the chairs of, of ah. the stage, of course. Or, or so there's also what you what you were saying in the beginning. You just make a small gesture and many sounds come out. So it has some something absurd, also something paradoxical. What I really like, and funny, not like you know in a slapstick sense, but yeah. there's like yeah. a, there's a humor hidden in this I don't know contrast or so. That yeah. Me. It's not something I, well, I, I'm, of course, I'm thinking like that, I'm, but not for the search of humor. I'm just, for me, it's, it's the way I, I think of the chairs. And it's also not like I start the chair piece and I know what's coming out. It's always a long struggle. And uh, the, chair, the chair piece particularly was very bad. Uh, I started with two chairs and then I found out uh, when I'm on the stage with two chairs, it's not good because they have to be more than I am. And if I'm sitting <coughs> on one chair, which I decided then to do only at the end, uh, then there's only the other one left, so they have to be a group. I um, there, there's a microphone in the beginning. I thought I'm gonna say all kind of important things in this microphone. Yet I don't say anything through the microphone. But the microphone is my main focus. So that's a bit how I define mm -hmm. things. Yes. Well, it seems that uh, through your um, movements, you're actually like changing the modulators more or less to the sound because the sounds seem to be quite fixed, but like. Um, well, not quite fixed, but the bass or the sound, whether it's like remodulation or whatever. But like, I mean, you have like um, events, like triggers, then the time in between events, um, velocity, like how, like what other like um, parameters can you use or like are you usually using for these kind of things? It's very, very different. No, I, I quickly show you the <coughs> the patch of empty chair, so you see what it's also not done uh, anywhere close to efficient. 
<laughs> I would say to uh, my students, students don't do it like that, but um, I do. Quickly look at how it looks. Oh yeah, it looks also very bad. <laughs> just for me. I can show you also night, but this, well, so anyway, this is just me. <laughs> oh, that's very and bad. But I also like sometimes our poly. In this case, I also like to see what things are really doing. Also, because this, these are this is what we just heard, and it are four different samplers, and they're opening and closing, and they are changing how they are played back, and their their time stretch, and their how they are combined, etc. So um, I, I try to make these kind of machines where I can change what I want. Mm -hmm. And um, that that that's then depends really on the piece, like th th because this is just a small part of the piece. And um, if you have then the later one part, that's easier. That's just there. But, but and, and it's also it's looping, but not really not real loops. Or in that case, every time the chair is taking up with the last part I showed you, the loop is going to be a bit quicker. So the longer I pick up the chair, the mm. quicker the loop is be. So I, I can control that, how quick is going to be the loop. But evidently, because of picking up the chair and putting it down, it's not something like you do in a rhythm. It's not like one. I mean, that's, then it's not natural anymore if I would really do that. So it's always in between this, am I making music and controlling my patch, or do I do the movement? Uh. Is it only about picking up the chair and putting it down, or does it also matter where in the space you put it? Sorry, oh, also. Uh, uh, was I too? Okay. So, is it only about picking up the chair and putting it back down, or is there also a specific sound for where you put it in the room? No, this is completely expect except that. Um, could you get my next button away again? Here. Um, it's just about putting them down, ex except that I do have different rules for myself, but this is completely like um, not interacting with the patch, but with my musical ideas, how they are placed. So there are certain parts where I really want to have them far away from each other, and that's because the only sound you hear during the chair is through the loudspeaker. and. Um, so that's for the spatialization of the sound is done by the chair. So if they're all three together, then, and then in the very last part, it starts to feed back the microphone, so they finally communicate, so to say. And then the chairs have to get closer, so there's also feedback happening. I'll quickly show you the setup. So I am at um, half of my lecture. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> And I'm going to finish here, so <laughs> I'm very quickly going to say, uh, so that I can send you the slides if you want. There are some other literature composing interactions. There, Maria uh, Bauman wrote about sensor technology. Physical origins are how the sound is made, which is in music mainly with, um, in, in electronic music, mainly the diaphragms of loudspeakers and instruments, it's all kind of other stuff. Some other quotes, nice, interesting book by Thor Magnussen, in case you don't know that yet. Then, um, physical origins of microphones and loudspeakers. There, I did quite some research on that. There's a website where you find the book. Imaginary origins, this is actually the most interesting part, but we haven't talked about it. For me, um, is that the what we imagine what something does. And um, th that's like when I eat the apple, that when you hear me eating it, <coughs> refers to a kind of of action to a physical to a movement or corporeal origin which evidently isn't there like I'm not doing with the apple but the sound refers to something 
So um, that was it. <laughs> I think we should stop now because otherwise we don't have a short break before Georgia. If you have any other questions.